my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God. Amen. Poor Thomas, he was not the only disciple who was skeptical of the story that Christ had risen. In the passage last week, we heard how the men thought the women were telling idle tales when they said the tomb was empty, that Thomas is the one who has the reputation that becomes permanently linked to the doubt expressed. I don't know whether you've been called a doubting Thomas or you've called someone else and you said, you know, don't be such a doubting Thomas, but not a very nice way to go down in history, I guess. We humans have a tendency to believe and remember things we see with our own eyes or experience ourselves. If you had been one of the disciples to be absent when Christ came into the room on that third day after he was crucified and buried, would you instantly have believed the others when they told you, Christ is risen? Remember, you've just been through a tumultuous roller coaster of emotions in the past little while. It was a triumphal march into Jerusalem a Passover meal with your fellow disciples and your teacher. Then you witnessed Jesus being dragged away by the soldiers. You were in the crowd, maybe, when they called Barabbas to be freed and Jesus to be crucified. You watched Jesus being flogged and nailed to a cross and then placed in a tomb, this man that you loved and spent time with. If we're to be truthful, I'm sure there are likely quite a few of us that that would have wanted to see it for ourselves and not just take somebody else's word for it. We wouldn't want, in John 20, verse 29, Jesus speaks to Thomas of us when he says, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. He was thinking of us even then. Blessed. When Thomas meets Christ personally, he immediately recognizes him and kneels and says, My Lord and my God, that's the part of the story that is important. Not that he doubted the others, but that once he was faced with the reality and the evidence, he let go of all that doubt and embraced and accepted the truth with an open heart. Anything more we know about Thomas doesn't come from the Bible, but from various historical records which say that he went on to preach the gospel in ancient Babylon, near the Tigris and Euphrates River, where Iraq is today. He is said to have traveled to Persia, present-day Iran, and continued to win disciples to the Christian faith. My brothers and sisters and I, my brother and sisters and I, even visited the church in Chennai, India, where he was buried for a time after being killed there. Apparently they moved his body later. Historical records show he was in India for about 20 years, from AD 52 to AD 72, and he preached Christ risen to all who would listen. Thomas used the roots of his experience with Jesus, the Christ, and allowed the Spirit to give him the wings to rise above his doubts and fears. Each of us has likely read an article or had a conversation with a friend or a neighbor that has raised questions we can't answer. I like the way Dr. William Lane Craig on his website, Reasonable Faith, proposes we as Christians should handle those situations. God has provided a more secure foundation for our faith than the shifting sands of evidence and argument, he says. He's given us the inner testimony of the Holy Spirit as the proper foundation for our knowledge of the great truths of the gospel. Doubt is not just a matter of debate or disinterested intellectual discussion. It involves a battle for your very soul. And if Satan can use doubt to immobilize us or destroy us, he will. The really important thing is learning to live with unanswered questions without allowing them to be destructive doubts. That, as Ms. Dr. Craig says, that I believe is, by God's grace, possible. Scientists and skeptics will continue to debate and look for our, or demand evidence or proof of God. Paul Tillich is saying something 
similar to Dr. Craig in his saying that Mark put on our order of service. Doubt isn't the opposite of faith, it is an element of faith. We as Christians will need to find the balance that allows that doubt to be a positive element of our faith and not a destructive one. Our second reading from Acts builds too on the commission given by Jesus in the John Gospel reading. Early in the fifth chapter of Acts, ahead of the verses read by Reg, the disciples had been arrested and imprisoned, and an angel had come and told them to go to the temple to preach and freed them from the prison. That is where the soldiers found them and once again brought them back to the council to be tried. And the verses we read, Peter declares we must obey God. The threat of persecution and imprisonment and death were of little consequence in his mind. He felt he had to be faithful to the power within. The Holy Spirit was compelling him to witness and testify to the love that overcame death and raised Jesus from the tomb. And those same reactions have kept the gospel story alive ever since. As Jim so eloquently worded it last week, we are now the new disciples, charged with the task of remembering Jesus, and charged with the task of remembering hope, so that all might know that Jesus lives. The torch has been passed down to us from those earliest disciples. The story must be kept alive and passed on. On Palm Sunday in Luke 19, verse 40, I read how Jesus responds to the Pharisees who were complaining about the crowds who were praising God and joyfully bearing witness to all they had seen and heard, saying, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Our own faith is often revived and rekindled when we listen to the stones shouting out, so to speak. Sometimes we are moved to tears by something in nature or by a hug. Or we find ourselves entranced by a sunset or transfixed by a picture-perfect view as we round the bend in a road or witness a rainbow after a rain shower. The evidence of God's love for us and for this world is all around us. And so, yes, even the stones shout out when we are silent. One of the articles I read, but unfortunately I couldn't find it again to find the author to give credit, <laughs> in writing about the persecution of Christians and the growth of the Christian church in spite of it, made a point that was uplifting and gave me hope. Sometimes it was suggested people are drawn to Christ because of the faith and witness of those who are willing to die for their beliefs. But this writer wanted us to consider another reason why the church grew and the story was kept alive. She felt that it was the witness and testimony and the way of life of the Christians that drew others to the faith and the way of living. In times and places where governments and rulers are oppressive and make life hard and fear-filled, Christians who love their neighbors and their enemies and care for one another and share what they have stand out as different and peace-filled. There's a, an appealingness to that peace when you're living in a fear-filled environment. For me, this rang true. And the Sunday School song came to mind as I was reading the article, This Little Light of Mine, I'm gonna let it shine. It makes sense to me that this is what would draw others to Christ. So how we act is important. After all the depressing articles I read on persecution in the world today, it was a perspective that made sense. It was not the act of martyrdom, but the day-to-day -day witness that was emphasized and held up as the catalyst to effect a change in people's lives and hearts in every corner of the world. Yet Christians are, yes, Christians are still persecuted and killed, according to statistics, even more today than in the early days of the church. But just as it didn't stop the disciples from preaching and healing and continuing to spread the news, so too today, many weigh the cost and still must speak out and testify to the love of God. As Micah described the Christian life, we need to do justice. And that was, I hadn't read that quote that way. I've always remembered it as seek justice. So do justice is just a little different. 
love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Here in this community, we are called to that life too. In the draft constitution, uh, our constitutional review team and the council upon review of it have left spaces that will need to be determined by us as a community and a family. What words best describe our mission, our vision, and our statement of faith? Why do we exist? This will hopefully not be a stagnant set of words, but will evolve and change as we change and grow. Jesus says today as he did in Jerusalem, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Amen.